Okay. Okay, welcome to track two again. Um, and now we've got Jacob Tobinson from the Met Office Informatics Lab. And uh, he's the lead engineer for the informatics lab with experience in software development, operational system engineering, and cloud architecture. And he uses these skills to ensure that the lab is building robust prototypes that are pushing the boundaries of technology. It's always funny hearing your bio off the website read out because it sounds <laughs> awful when you say it to other people. You like write a thing on like LinkedIn and you're like, oh yeah, this is awesome. Probably. I oh, probably copied and pasted it and emailed it to Chris, but anyway, yeah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Jacob. You might have seen me at these things before. I try and I spoke at this conference last year and I try and speak at different pieces. I tend to do a lot of that kind of stuff for the job that I do now. Um, here's a word cloud of things that I like, just so you can kind of get an overall impression of who I am and where my, my biases are um, within everything I'm going to talk about. So... Can I ask you to solve the lanyard microphone problem? Yes. <laughs> oh, is, that, is it rustling? Is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that Cheers. better if it's there? Yeah. Um, so this talk is going to be about some work that we've been doing for a while now, but this is kind of like a combination of little bits and pieces um, that we've been working on. So I'm sure everybody by now has, has heard of the MetOffice in this conference. Hopefully you've got a nice little MetOffice Google Cardboard to, to play with and, and bin some of those talks. Um, I specifically work in the informatics lab, which is like an R&D area within the Met Office. We're like a mixed discipline team of technology people, science people, uh, graphic design people, and we kind of come together to try and solve some of the uh, problems that we have as an organization, right? We're a huge organization, there's like 2,000 people. We have all sorts of weird internal culture problems that every massive organization has to deal with, all sorts of scale issues that we have to work with. So our team kind of has a, a remit of trying to solve some of this stuff. We also have a remit of exploring new technology. So quite often, like we'll go to a conference and people will go like, wow, this thing's amazing. And then we have to like try it and go, yes, we agree it's amazing or no, it's all just hype. And like, there's a lot of kind of um, responsibility on us to, to really try and get stuck in with things and give things a really good test drive. Um, and then we also try and do the same from like the science end. So trying to do new methods, trying to explore new techniques, technologies, trying to get some of our maybe older, like longer serving staff out of different ruts and into trying new tech. You know, we struggle with lots of things around like machine learning is like super hot right now, right? But it's just stats. And we've got loads of people in our building that have been doing stats for 40 years and they'll look at the papers and go, well, obviously, like I was talking about this 20 years ago and now everybody's excited because it's in Snapchat, like wah. But, there's a risk of them just dismissing that stuff. And it's like, well, actually, you might want to go back and review those methods that you were looking at 20 years ago because they're becoming more popular and more fleshed out and then maybe are more useful now. So that's a bit of an overview of what we try and do. Um, we are very public about what we do in our team. So everything goes on our blog. We dump all of our code onto GitHub. Some of the stuff we like maintain, some of the stuff we just brain dump onto GitHub. So however useful that is. Um, good luck. You're welcome to go and take any stuff and play with it if you can get past a lots, of readmes, uh, lots of repositories with no readmes, but you'll be fine. Um, so this talk is all about running massive workloads in the cloud, which is something that I've been exploring recently. But I kind of wanted to talk about it in the context of like doing a specific thing in the cloud and kind of the journey that we went through to get to that place and some of the problems that we, we kind of faced a lot along those, those lines. So something we announced recently that you may have come across is we just dumped a load of data into S3. It's about 80 terabytes of historical model runs going back a few years um, that you can go and grab and you can do whatever you like with. It's research data. So if you want to go and look into it, try and see if there's some value in that data, go ahead. Um, but 80 terabytes is a reasonable amount of data, right? It's quite a small amount for us, given what we produce every day, but it's quite a lot to actually feasibly get into a cloud platform and make available to people in kind of a straightforward way that they can use it. You know, like a lot of people will come along and go, oh, I'd really like that data, but I can't exactly download it somewhere. What am I meant to do with it? And that's kind of some of the problems that we, that we face around that. So the first step is actually getting that data into the cloud. I must confess, when I saw this image, I thought, oh, a, a crate with a hot air balloon going into the clouds, that's perfect. And then I looked at it again a minute ago and thought, oh, it's a parachute, that's going the wrong way. But you get the idea, right? The data's got to go into the cloud somehow. <laughs> and getting 70 terabytes of data into the, into the cloud is non-trivial. Um, the other thing we have to do is actually make it open and kind of let people access that data without it costing us a fortune um, or in them a fortune. Um, 
And then the other thing is making the data open in a, in a standard that people actually like. Right? Our supercomputer writes data in a specific file format that we know and love, but nobody else has ever heard of it. Right? It's not that it's like super proprietary, it's just that it's super niche, right? so nobody really knows how to deal with it and is comfortable dealing with it. Whereas there are some other file formats that lots of people like, very common in academia, so there's a responsibility on us to convert our data into a file format that people are happier using. So there's a file format called HDF, which if you've not heard of it, it's for storing scientific data sets. It's a kind of, I like to think of it as like a cold storage database type file format, right? You can think of it like using a SQLite file or something like that, right? It's a database that you store on disk, the specific ways of accessing it, but it's for storing all sorts of different shapes of data. So a lot of the stuff we deal with is in grids, right? So, um, you know, it's like super multi-dimensional arrays of things, right? Where the data, if you imagine, will break up the UK into a grid, latitude and longitude, we also break it up into altitude, you've then got time steps going forward in time. Um, we run this model every three hours, say, um, so you've got, that's like another dimension of like model start times. You've then got all the different variables like cloud fraction, temperature, humidity, all the different things, right? So you can imagine all these ridiculous numbers of dimensions going off. And a lot of that gets stored as arrays, like nested linked arrays on disk. Um, and HDF5 and NetCDF have like a load of metadata around that that show you how to access the data. Um, and it's really great for us because we'll run a model run, we'll dump it to disk, we'll then move it from there onto tape, push it into the archive and not look at it again for 20 years. And that file format's awesome for that because everything's kind of wrapped up in the file format, right? The whole kind of database stuff. We're not, we don't want to keep it like hot in some kind of, you know, MongoDB or something. So it works perfectly for that kind of thing. And it works perfectly for kind of distributing data to other people because they can kind of pull it even if it's old and kind of, you know, work with it in different ways. But there's also a load of negatives that come along with it, like nobody's ever heard of it um, outside of universities and places like the Met Office, and it's just a bit gnarly to deal with sometimes. So it's, there's a few trade-offs, um, and, and we, we feel that for disseminating the data that we're trying to at the moment, it's probably the right format for trying to, to get that out to the community. So we've got a load of data in a proprietary format that's come out of the supercomputer. We want to get it into the cloud in an open format so that other people can have it, right? That's like the premise. So I'll talk you a little bit through kind of the chain of events that we would imagine somebody will go through, starting from us through to what they're gonna do, right? So we've got from us producing data through to somebody else analyzing that data. So the first thing we're gonna do is somebody at the Met Office is gonna run a model on the supercomputer, right? We've got nice shiny supercomputers, which a photographer lit really nicely one day, um, so we can do talks like this. We've got three of these machines now. We've got our two data centers in the, in the main Met Office building, and we've got the new data center that we just built on the other side of the motorway. These are both reasonably full of quite expensive supercomputer equipment now. Um, I made my, my notes too big, so I can't read it now. So I've got some probably out of date statistics now, right? But at the time that I was told these things, we had the 11th, 38th, and 39th fastest machines in the world. So they're probably like 400, 500, and 600 now, because this was from like January. Um, but, you know, they're, they're ridiculous machines. The three machines combined will run at about 23 petaflops, which is impressive if that makes sense to you. <laughs> My favorite stat about all of this is these machines use 13 megawatts of electricity, right? Which, if you remember that a megawatt of electricity costs about a million pounds, these things cost a lot to run, right? This is why we kind of have all sorts of big budgets that get all over the newspaper and things. But we have to run these models on specific periods every day, and we have to make this data available to our own staff and staff at other institutions in order to produce all the normal weather products that you see, right? So the weather forecast on the telly, all the warnings that go out, and then all the other random products that we make. So that data, that original raw data that comes out of that machine, we have a responsibility to make that available to people, right? These machines were bought with taxpayers' money, so we have to make the data available. Any products and stuff that we or others derive from that can then go on and be, go to the commercial arm, and that's great, but we want to get this raw data out to people. But the raw data is also the biggest and hardest data to move around, right? The final products are usually like reports and things, right? PDFs, you can just email those to people. But the actual raw data that we want to give to everybody is quite hard to move about. Um, currently, we've got lots of data. 
Every day, we're adding lots more data. Right, so of all of that, probably about 40 terabytes each day is like actual operational model data that's coming out from all the core products that go off and generate everything. And the other 160 is scientists running experiments, new versions of the model, kind of new bits of research that they're looking into. So by 2020, we're gonna have a lot more data than we have today. And we're already struggling to wade through the massive treacle-like mass of data that we have right now. So this is kind of our ongoing problem. This is like my life at the moment. So the hardest thing that we find with data is that it's really hard to move around. Right? We heard a stat, this is probably like totally misquoted, so forget this, but we heard somebody at Google say to us recently that unless somebody accesses a number more than a thousand times, they just generate it on the fly. There's no point putting it on disk because then getting it off disk and getting it back out again is just a pain. Just let it be recalculated every time you need to use it because moving things is really, really hard. When you end up with terabytes and terabytes of data sat on disk, it's just really, really difficult. So one of the things we can do is we can pump data over the broadband into a cloud provider. So a lot of the work I've been doing recently is on AWS. So some of the stuff in this talk is going to be like AWS specific, but like other vendors exist. Um, but my problem is about getting data from our data center into S3, right? So that we can then start working with it and experimenting with that data. So we can just push it over the broadband link, and that's great. We have nice big fat broadband links within the organization. If you're within the organization and you do a speed test, you, we actually show up as an ISP, right? Because we have a, a pretty decent connection out into the internet. But as an individual person, me, an employee of the Met Office, I can only get about 15 megabits of that connection at any one time, right? I can, if I build a production system and go through all the appropriate processes and build a decent system, then we can get network rules applied so that that system has got loads of bandwidth and that's great. But that also takes a lot of time and isn't particularly helpful in like an R&D kind of world. So for me trying to get 70 terabytes of data out, 15 megabits a second is just not practical, right? I'd have to wait a long time. So if you're not seeing these, these are hilarious. Amazon provide these devices, which is literally a box of hard drives. They put it in the post, that comes to you. You plug it in, you copy the data onto it, you put it back in the post, it goes back to them. They plug it into S3 at the other end and the data goes into S3, right? It works really well. It's weird, it's crazy, um, but there's a good XKCD comic that I nearly put in here, but it's talking about the, the power of sneaking out, right? The latency on it is super high, right? The, the lag time of actually requesting the, the data being moved into AWS and then getting there is a couple of weeks, but the bandwidth is also super huge. So it's great, you can put loads in. So we wanted to get 70 terabytes up. These come in 50, 80, and 100 terabyte models. So that's great, we went for the 80. Um, and they sent that out to us. So getting things like this to happen in a huge enterprise organization is really difficult. I go up to our security people and go, Amazon are gonna send me a random appliance. They won't tell you what's in it. They won't tell you what it's running. They won't tell you how they made it, but I want to plug it straight into the network and I want to fill it full of data off the supercomputer. And they look at me like, Ugh. so. Surprisingly, actually, the security was reasonably easy because Amazon is really hot on accreditation and stuff. So it's quite easy to just show all the right certificates and everything is fine. But it's still like me turning up with this random appliance and saying, I need to install this into our data center. And the, the people that we have in the building for installing hardware in the data center go, oh, great. We'll find a rack for that. We'll put a shelf in. We'll figure out the right place for this to go. And I say to them, oh, by the way, in four days time, I also want you to take it back out again. And they were like, oh, well, that's like not how their processes work, right? That's not how they think, because they think, I'm gonna give you a server and you're gonna install it and then it's gonna be there forever. And then eventually we'll get rid of that whole rack and it'll come back out again in 30 years time so that we can make some room for something new. So getting them to put something in and then take it straight back out was a bit weird and a bit unusual. Same for the networks teams, right? They're used to us requesting static IP addresses to be assigned, bits of networking kit plumbed in so that we can get really nice fast connections between these different systems. But again, when I go and say, I need this for four days, and they're like, well, that's a lot of work for four days. And it's like, well, that's part of the problem of not working in like a cloudy type world. Like when we're trying to do something with actual hardware, it's a real pain and our kind of change processes aren't, aren't suited to that. So it was a bit exciting getting all of that in. We eventually managed to get this device in and I managed to get a really nice machine available for me to run the, the client on, right? So to get data onto the Snowball, you run this client um, that then 
like pulls the data from disk and pushes it into the device. But for some reason, I get the feeling this device probably had a load of disks in and they had some kind of RAID configuration on. And I reckon it had probably some of the disks had failed and the RAID was running a bit funky because the client was just trickling the data into the device and I could not get it to go any faster. Um, so we just ended up waiting and it took about 10 days for this data to flow into the device. And we sent it back, it took them about 10 days to get it off. Um, but I mean, I think we were just unfortunate with, with that device. We're about to do this all, all over again. So I'm, I'm hoping we were unfortunate. But it was slow. But once we got that data up, we got that data pushed into S3, that's great, we've got this data here, but it's in this proprietary format. And we can give that to people, we don't mind giving that to people, but they're not necessarily gonna have the tools to actually use that data, and if they do, it's probably not gonna be as fully featured as using the open standards, because everybody's developing different visualization libraries and things that are all kind of based on the open standards. So we need to provide the, we need to do some processing on this data to get it open, and then we also need to provide them with some tools in order for them to continue doing work with it. So the most important thing that we have been thinking about recently in order to, to process these vast amounts of data is that we need to be as lazy as possible when we do it. We need to do as little work as possible in order to convert this data from one format to another. So. This applies a little bit more to the like, analysis side of things rather than this initial data conversion we had to do. Because right? this initial conversion, we had to take all 70 terabytes and convert it from one to the other. So we have to touch all the data and that's just life. But a lot of analysis people might want to do, they might not want all the data. They might just want the area over London for a specific period of time and they might only care about temperature. So they don't want that whole 80 terabytes. They just want the bit of data they care about. And so we need to provide them tools so that they can just use the bit of data that they care about. Because at the moment, they have to like wade through everything to try and find it. So I kind of wanted to briefly go over a few tools that we, that we like um, and, and that we maintain internally as well to, to kind of try and empower this. So I'm going to skip through this a little bit. But one of the tools that we have internally is a Python library called Iris. Iris is really cool because it supports all these gnarly atmospheric file formats like NetCDF and, and Grib and things. But it's lazy in how it accesses data. So Say I've got a NetCDF file that's three terabytes, and I want a bit of data from inside it. The standard way you would do that would be to load that file, right? In any library, you would load that file. In Iris, you say, please load this file, and Iris goes, okay, I've loaded that file. And it's like, well, that was three terabytes, I don't believe you, because you've said to me immediately that you've loaded this file. <coughs> what it's actually done is it's just grabbed all the metadata headers out of that file and given you back the metadata, going, I'm aware of all of this data. If you actually want it, I'll go and get it, but I'm not gonna do it until you really, really make me because there's no point in wasting time loading excess data. If, if this file contains England and I only care about London, there's no point in me loading England and then discarding it again. We might as well just wait a bit and then load London. So Iris is great in that you can load the data, you can do all sorts of different operations on it and in the Python code will run and it will say, oh yes, I've cropped up this area and I've taken an average across this and it immediately responds with everything but it's not, it's lying to you, right? It's not done any of these things until I actually then try and plot it, right? I run a visualization library and plot it and it goes, oh, actually I should have done those things in order to plot this. So I'll just quickly run all of those. But it, it like runs a minimal set of stuff. So that's great. This is the, it's open source, it's on GitHub. It's maintained internally, but we've got loads of contributors from all around the place. So it's great if you're into that kind of thing. And this is kind of like what a data cube looks like, right? So you. You load the cube and then it's printing the cube and it's showing that there's, there's stuff in there, weathery stuff, but that's fine. So the other thing we like is Jupyter Notebooks. So if you're into data science stuff, you've probably come across these, right? But Jupyter Notebooks are like a web-based code editing thing along with like a Google document type thing. It feels a lot like using Google Docs, but you can write Python and it will execute within that, within that session as well. So it's really cool. There's loads of visualization stuff in there to make your life easier and you can do some really funky things. But the way this works is it runs Python somewhere, usually on your desktop if you just run this locally, and then it runs like a web server and you connect to the web page and when you send it Python, it will execute that on the, on the little Python instance that's running on your machine. But that Python instance doesn't have to be on your machine. That Python instance can be on an EC2 instance in AWS right next to that data and I don't have to pull it across the internet, I can just pull it across AWS's internal network. But that's, that's quite neat, right? So that's kind of another like lazy side to it. Also, if you put Python notebooks into GitHub, it will display them all nicely, which is just nice. So the last thing, um, which I've done a lot of talking about recently, so 
Google around for this because it's cool. But Dask is a bit like the compute counterpart to Iris, right? So Iris is all about data, loading data. I only want to load the right amount of data. Dask is all about processing data and only doing the bare minimum to process data, right? So when you write this all Python again, right? So when you write some, some Dask like empowered code to do stuff, it again tells you, oh, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, but it hasn't. What it's actually doing is building an execution graph in the background so that it knows how to execute that code when you need to get to the end of it. And it, it does that for a few reasons. One is because that graph can then be pulled apart and parallelized on different cores or different machines, and that's really cool. The other thing it can do is be lazy about stuff. So if I do loads and loads of execution on all of the UK, and then I cut out London and, and plot it, it will know, oh, I don't actually need to compute all this other stuff because the last step is going to be just cropping out this little section in the middle. So I'm only going to do the compute that re is required so that I've got this bit left at the end. So it like, ignores all the rest of it. And it's really clever around that. So you get graphs that look like this. This is like perfectly parallelized job, right? This would just be spread across a cluster. This is like a traditional map reduce, right? So you write map, 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 and then as a reduce to get the answer back together, and that pops out the other, other end. But it can also do like complex compute graphs as well, right? So where you might have some maps and some reduces and some other bits and pieces, and it will try and optimize and parallelize this as much as possible. So this kind of leads on to how we can run such big systems kind of in the cloud. Oh, and I'm on time with my timings on here, sounds good. So we're looking at running a lot of this stuff on AWS, partly just because of the way our team works. Like, because we're like an R&D team, we're quite, we, we like risk, right? We're, we're very much up in the, um, oh, what was the thing from the other talk before? I, what's that? Pioneers. Pioneers, that's it. I always hear the policeman and commando and, and grunt analogy, but there's, yeah, there's the pioneers and the settlers as well. There? Yeah, so we're kind of up in that end, right? We like risk, risk is cool, um, but risk next to the supercomputer is not cool. People don't like it when we do risky things next to the supercomputer. We can't just install random stuff on our core network because the supercomputer is also on the core network and people get scared of things like that. So. In our team specifically, we just build everything in AWS or Azure or wherever that's kind of off the network. It's decoupled from what we're doing. Um, and that's really useful for us because then we can try out and do whatever we like. If our AWS account gets hacked, we just delete everything and start again. Um, infrastructure as code helps with that a lot. So next slide, that was a good segue. Um, so one of the things that makes all of the, our life a lot easier with this stuff is using Terraform. So I won't super go into what Terraform is, but we really, really like Terraform. It basically just allows you to specify VMs, networks, all sorts of different bits of software that you need to configure as code, and then you run Terraform, and it goes away and makes all of those things exist, and then you can destroy everything, and it makes all those things not exist anymore, and you can make things scale up and down, and it's really, it's really nice. This is what allows me as a sysadmin to sysadmin 2,000 VMs without being sad. Right? Because I can make them appear and disappear and everything's fine. If one gets poorly, I can just delete it and it, it gets recreated by auto-scaling groups and all that kind of stuff. So for building our kind of infrastructure underneath, this is, this is really, really useful. But then for actually scheduling our workloads on this, um, everybody loves containers. We're into containers too. So um, at the moment, we've got this cluster that's running on AWS. It's running Kubernetes for actually scheduling the work. And we're using Kubernetes to schedule Dask workers to then run big Dask jobs, right? So there's kind of different levels of abstraction. Um, you know, you've got your kind of infrastructure as a service at the bottom or your AWS stuff, and, and Terraform is great for kind of handling all of that and managing that and making your life easy and automating that. Then you've got Kubernetes as your platform as a service above that, which makes your work scheduling nice and easy and kind of scaling things and paralyzing things and bringing things up and down really nice from like a developer, DevOpsy point of view. And then, on top of that, you've got all your kind of software as a service that you want to provide people. And so to us, that might be providing Jupyter Notebooks to people or providing a Dask cluster to people. So there's like this software as a service layer. And it's nice having those different levels of abstraction in between. It, it makes, life, makes life a lot easier. So one of the things that we really care about, because we're the government, is value for money. You know, If there's a cheaper version, we're going to buy that because it's cheaper, regardless of whether it works or not. Um, so we care a lot about value for money, and on, on platforms like AWS, we really want to try and get value for money as much as we can. So we kind of tweak and configure all sorts of things so that when we scale systems up, scale them back down again, it will try and kill the instances that, are, that have the, the fewest minutes left on their billing period, if that makes sense. Right? You start an instance and you get an hour. 
If we start 100 instances and we turn one off, we want one that's at 59 minutes, not at four minutes, right? We want to try and maximize that, that cost. We also um, make quite a lot of use of spot pricing within our team to try and get the best rates that we can. So if you've not come across spot pricing, Amazon have got huge data centers full of servers and people are renting them, right? But they've also got lots of spare capacity so that when people come along and rent stuff, they get it straight away. But they don't want that capacity to be sat there doing nothing. So they auction it off on a market for like much, much cheaper. But the caveat with that is if somebody comes along willing to pay full price, they'll take it away from you and give it to the person willing to pay full price. So it's great because you can like get like a 90% cost saving on certain machines if you run them at certain times. But you can't be confident that that work will always run. So if you want to run like an operational production system that you're always going to have customers hitting all the time, then it's probably not, I mean, you can do all sorts of stuff to make it viable for that, but it's not like the target for that. Whereas for running scientific analysis workloads that we're interested in running, where it's like, well, if there's 100 machines and then there's 60 machines and then there's 1,000 machines and then there's four machines, it'll still get done eventually, right? Even if this cluster is going up and down based on the market price, like, the cheaper the market price, the faster it's going to happen. But kind of, we're expecting this job to take three days anyway. Kind of situation. Like that's that's kind of where we are. So, spot instances are great for that. AWS also has a specific thing for managing big spot clusters called Spot Fleet. So instead of saying, I want a machine with two cores and eight gig of RAM, and I'm willing to pay this much for it, right? That's that's kind of a standard traditional spot model, right? You you say that for that machine, and you then get that machine as long as the market price is below that, right? And then as the people request instances and the market price moves up, they'll take it away from you. Spot fleet, you basically say, that is like my base unit, right? Two gig, two cores and eight gig of RAM is like my base unit. I want one of those to be worth one, right? And something with four cores and 16 gig of RAM is worth two and so on, right? So bigger machines are worth more to you. Um, and then you just say to it, I want a thousand units of stuff. Right, so you set where you're kind of waiting, and then it provides you with a, a myriad of, of machines that add up to the quota that you specified. So if your workload is compute heavy, then obviously you higher weight the, um, the compute machines, and if, if it's memory intensive, then you higher weight the memory machines and that kind of thing. But what you end up with is their system will automatically give you the best value for money that it can out of all the available machines within the different spot markets. So instead of you trying to play on a single spot market for M4 large instances, you're now playing on 40 different markets for all sorts of different machines and it's gonna get you like the lowest price. It also makes Amazon's life easier because then they can give you the machines that they've got too much of and they can take away the machines that they think they might need for later and, and all sorts of stuff like that. And it just makes your workload a little bit more flexible. But it's not super easy. So one of the things that I found is you need to make your cluster pretty diverse if you're going to scale big, right? So the first time I ran this, I went for, I think I chose about eight different types. So there was like M4 large and C4 large, which both had like two cores and, and have much RAM and, and some R instances as well. And I said, oh, I'll have those in two of the Ireland data centers and one of the London data centers or something like that. So I, I picked about eight or 10 different varieties within my fleet. And I said, I'm willing to pay this much for it, and now I'm going to scale it up. And so this is when we were experimenting with the data conversion. Um, and so this data conversion, this 70 terabytes of data, we sat down and worked out that in order to convert that from one file format to the other, it would take about 2,000 CPU hours right, to run that. So I can run it on a single core machine for 2,000 hours, or hopefully I can run it on a 2,000 core cluster in one hour. right? And, and that will cost me the same with an AWS because I'm paying by the hour. So that was the experiment that we were trying to run so I went for this small fleet, and I started it, and I kept scaling it up, and kept scaling it up. I was trying to push to about 3,000 CPU cores, right? I wanted to overshoot my, my 2,000 estimate so that if I was a bit wrong, it's fine. And also, we wanted to complete within that hour, so we didn't, you know, if all the machines got billed for an hour and a second, I'd be really sad, because that would cost us two hours. So I started this cluster up, and the cluster started scaling, and then it started going really weird and zigzaggy, and machines kept provisioning and then going away and then provisioning and going away. And I was like, well, Amazon's huge. There's no way that we can be like causing the, the price in the market to fluctuate that much that we're going to be shooting through our limits and then starting to be going up and down. Um, but it turns out that's exactly what we did. So we were running this in the London region, which was super new at the time. So there can't have been that much unused capacity. But you can see here, I turned on the cluster, which used up most of their unused capacity 
Um, so the price just shot through the roof, which caused them to take a load of machines off us again because the price had gone through the roof. So the price then fell again. So they gave us a load of machines back, which made the price go through the roof. And so you can see it like zigzagging at the top, right? And this, this screenshot got emailed around um, our Amazon architects and they sent us an email saying, what are you, what are you doing? Um, and so in order to run a job like this, we had to get permission from them anyway, right? You get limits on your AWS account when you first set it up. You get like, I think you can run 50 machines at a time. If you're using the spot market, you get five times as much as your limit, right? So you can have 250 machines. But I wanted like a couple of thousand. So I said to them, can you put my limits up? And they were a bit like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> and um, I guess this is why, because they thought, they, they must have been thinking, what if he does something stupid? This will happen. And they were like, oh, no, you won't do something stupid. And then, and then I did. Um, so diversity is really key when you're running these fleets, right? So the way we changed this is just added loads of more and more flavors of machines, right? And um, so that when, when um, I provision this fleet. I asked for the same size again, but it could then pick from loads of different varieties of machines. And it wouldn't just use up all the M4 larges. It would give me a, a nice spread, and it would help them balance their workload. It still did double the cost of all of the markets that we were using, but it was still, you know, it had gone from 10% of the market price to 20% of the market price, which wasn't horrendous compared to going up to around 90% of the market price. The trouble with that is we'd made some bad assumptions about the type of machines we were going to get and how we would pack our workload onto those machines. So to think about that, I'm going to briefly dip into different scaling types, right? So vertical scaling is going from a small machine to a big machine, right? You still have a machine, and it's still going to do stuff. It's just going to do more stuff, because it's got more cores and more memory, or whatever. You then got horizontal scaling, which is I've got one machine, and I want it to be faster, so I'm going to get more machines. And they're all going to be the same, and that's fine, but I'm going to scale that way. Whereas scaling with a spot fleet is more like this, right? You're going to get some small, some big, you're going to get like a higgledy-piggledy mess of stuff, and you need, really, for your application to use all of each one, right? Whereas the way that we'd set it up initially is it was using the smallest one, like, and that was kind of its, its maximum in the settings that we'd set. You know, you set your heap size in Java and all that kind of stuff, but you target that for the smaller machines. So if they give you a really big machine because you're trying to increase your diversity, you're only going to use a fraction of that big machine, which is wasteful. So we had to kind of sit down and tweak all of our scripts so that they would do some detection of the machine. So when the machine started up, it would go, how many cores have I got? How much memory have I got? Right, I'm going to pack loads of processes in so that they fill up this machine. So there was a load of stuff we had to think about around the way that the application got, got deployed. I'm going to come on to that in a minute. So the way that we wanted to run this workload was using Dask. Um, the first time we ran it, we actually didn't use Kubernetes or anything like that. We were just using really dumb bootstrap scripts to just, when the machine came up, it would install Docker, it would pull down the Dask worker container image, and it would run the image and tell it where the scheduler was. And it would literally give it the IP address of the scheduler. That IP address was in the Terraform config. So all these machines would boot. They'd connect to the scheduler, which was just running on another machine, a reasonably powerful machine. Um, and that would be, you know, that would be kind of the, the beginning process. This worker would then start and run and start um, consuming data and converting it to another type and storing it. Um, and so when we were dealing with the packing, it was like, right, actually, we're going to try and run eight of this container on this machine. We're going to run two of that container on this machine to try and get it to, like, to, to fill the resources as much as possible. Um, and the, the idea was to build a cluster that would kind of scale up to thousands of cores. So one of the things we had to think about is, how do we know that this is working, right? I can put this data in and I can start my cluster, but how, how can I be sure that the cluster is actually running and doing what I think it is? And so monitoring is kind of, I talked about monitoring at this conference last year, right? So go and listen to the, the SoundCloud thing if you, if you want to listen to my ramblings on that. Um, but the monitoring must scale with the cluster, right? If you've got a nice little monitoring box that's chugging along and then you bring up a thousand machines and they all start trying to dump telemetry and logs into this poor little monitoring box, it's just gonna fall over. Um, so we were experimenting with a few things. Obviously you can use cloud hosted kind of scalable monitoring solutions like CloudWatch and things in AWS where you push all your logs into that um, or different kinds of databases that will scale and things. I was trying to, I was hoping that what I was working on at the time meant that I could keep vertically scaling my monitoring box, but just keep one monitoring box and just make it bigger and bigger as the cluster went up because it would only use a small portion and that I would, because it's R&D, I'd think about, I'd worry about that later. Um, but one of the things that I found with that is 
I was starting these clusters in one go, so I was just saying, a thousand machines, please, and it would start a thousand machines, and they'd all take roughly the same amount of time to boot. They'd all then connect to the monitoring box, and they were speaking over SSL, because that's nice and secure. So immediately, a thousand machines would appear, and they'd all try and have an SSL handshake with this one little box. So its CPU would just hit the ceiling, and it would die, and then that was the end of that. So the workaround for that, annoyingly, was to just start the machine up in batches of 300, just three batches of 300, and then a batch of 100, and then it was fine. It just didn't overwhelm that monitoring box. But it, it, that monitoring box didn't scale, and so that wasn't very good, really. That was bad. Um, and so when you're running clusters this size, you've got to really think about all the other infrastructure that goes with it and all the other services you care about and, and actually getting metrics into those. Um, so in the future with this kind of thing, we'd make sure that we had like a monitoring cluster that would scale based on load and that kind of thing. And it would, it would move, up, move up higher. Cool. Click, click. Oh. Everybody's having clicking problems today. Yeah, right. So monitoring is kind of one of those interesting things because whenever you see talks on monitoring or read blogs on monitoring, you usually see a screenshot from Grafana and everybody's happy because Grafana's pretty. But a, having a big screen in the corner with a graph like this on it looks really cool, right? Everybody walking past your office goes like, wow, they must be doing some cool stuff because they've got like a big fancy dashboard. But it also means that you've got to look at it all the time, right? And make sure that everything is okay. And you've got to understand it as well. And it's really interesting being a technologist working with scientists because they look at my graphs and go, well, that's a terrible graph. And it's like, well, why? I can see my CPU usage. And they're like, well, yeah, but what's that graph telling me? It's like, well, it's telling me that the CPU usage is, is that. And, and, and uh, they tend to just say, well, but like that graph isn't telling a story, so why does it exist? Why do you care? Like, surely you should only have a graph that shows it climbing or doing something weird or something unusual. Why do you care about this graph the rest of the time? And I was kind of thinking about it. I was going, well, I like having this dashboard because I can look at it, and eventually I learn what normal is. And then one day when it's not normal, I'll look at it and go, oh, that's not normal. But that doesn't scale at all either, right? That's just kind of like the inherent like nerd in me that likes this big screen. But it's super important to have proper benchmarking, baselining, and alerting based on you know, having a machine somewhere else learning what normal is and then saying to you, this is not normal, you should look at the graph. And then you look at the graph and go, oh, look, this graph's telling me a story because it's not normal. Right? That's a much better flow. So you know, we still have the graph in the corner because it looks cool to, to outsiders, right? But there's a, it's really important to, to kind of set up where you're alerting properly. And there's a lot to unpack in that. So if you follow this link, this is a really good link. It links to a Google Doc written by some guy that works at Google, and it's his kind of philosophy on how to do monitoring and alerting properly. It's really, really interesting. It focuses a lot on kind of alerting based on customer impact rather than kind of system impact. And it's like, well, if you imagine a disk fills on a machine, should I be alerted that that disk is at 100%? And his philosophy is, no, I shouldn't be alerted that the disk is 100%. But if a user starts getting loads of 500 errors, I should be alerted on that and also told at the same time, this disk is full, by the way. So it can help me put these pieces together and do root cause analysis, but I'm not getting stupid alerts every 10 minutes saying, oh, this CPU's gone over 80%, this CPU's gone over 80%. I'm actually getting kind of customer-based and, and user-based impacts. And then the others are kind of following, following through. It's, again, read the document, it's really, really good. Um, but, one of the kind of best ways of figuring out what's going in this system is making sure that I don't really care what's happening in the cluster because the cluster's stateless. I want to put my state somewhere else that I can look at easily and monitor easily. So one of the things about running a cluster with a thousand machines in it is those machines are going to break. When you boot a thousand machines, you're not going to get a thousand machines joining the cluster. Right? That's just one of those things. You should get a thousand machines joining the cluster, but you won't. One of them, will, something weird will have happened. Right? They'll have all tried to pull the same Docker image from Docker Hub, and Docker Hub will have rate limited your IP address for a second, which will have caused one of the machines not to pull the image. And so you need some kind of monitoring and some kind of healing on that so that that machine sits there for five minutes, goes, I'm not working properly, so I'm just going to turn off again. And the auto scaling kicks in, brings up another one, which then Handshake properly gets the right image and joins the cluster, right? So you need to make sure that when your machines fail, because they will constantly, that they can detect when they failed, that they will remove themselves when failed, or something else will remove them, and that other things can come up and try and take their place, and it, it can self-heal as things go wrong, as they will do, and it's just, it's just one of those things. 
Keeping all the storage external is also really important because when those machines fail, you don't want anything to be on those disks that you care about because you just want to black those disks and let them disappear and, and bring them back. So as I said, we're making all this data available on S3. So all the raw proprietary data went into S3 as it was. And what we really want to do is pull a file out of S3, convert it to the new file format, and then push it back into S3 again. I don't care about what's on that machine. If the machine fails midway, that's fine. The original file is still there. Another machine can pop up, take over, pull that file, write it back, and delete the old one. Right? But then, in that case, I have to manage the workload of all of these machines. So again, um, using something like Dask is great because it builds these big graphs and distributes things. But we also found massively scalable distributed queues to help. So we, uh, we used SQS for this. Right, but we put all of these files into S3, and then we put a message on a queue for every single file that we put into S3, and this cluster was just consuming messages, processing files, and Dask was just handling keeping the workers alive and consuming messages from the queue until that queue was done. So my monitoring to know that everything was working was to look at the rate at which the queue was going down, you know, the rate at which S3, um, you know, one bucket was shrinking and another bucket was growing, right? I don't really care about each individual machine, I just care about the overall cluster and what's happening within that. So, what time is it? Yeah, so that's about right. Um, that was kind of like a, quite a brain dumpy kind of thing, just to kind of talk you through an example situation. So that cluster that we ran had 3,000 CPU cores in it was about a thousand machines altogether because you know we had this kind of hodgepodge of different machine types. And it took about 40 minutes to run that job, which is what we'd expected given 2,000 cores would do it in an hour. So we pulled all that data out, wrote all that data back in, we then put together a pretty web page and have made that open to everybody. So the idea is that from the lessons that we've learned about how to look at this data and how to analyze these data and the tools that we like, other people can dig into this data and see what's useful to them and, and, and then we can talk from there. So, that's roughly everything I wanted to cover. I'm um, hopefully, these videos don't loop automatically. You have to like right click and say loop, right? But this is just a screenshot of the cluster scheduler running, right? So this is two and a half thousand cores at this point within the scaling. And each little green line is a file being converted, right? And this is just a little looped video. That's pretty while you ask me questions. So thank you very much. Yep. How many attempts? So, I worked out that it would cost me 40 quid from AWS to do the conversion, and my bill that month was about 400. So I guess that's nine failed attempts, roughly, right? But I had clusters coming up and down and up and down. Right, but we learned so many lessons. It was, it was 400 quid well spent to learn how to do these things and, and do a bit of, bit of kind of problem solving and troubleshooting. So. You know, we're about to do the same thing again in a couple of weeks, and I'm much more confident that I can probably do it in like three goes rather than ten. Um, it's not really a tech, tech, tech question, but I'm curious, how do you get a budget? Like, do you have to pitch to someone and say, I want money? So, yeah, it's complicated. It might be worth talking about offline, but basically, we, um, we're like, a small unit that reports directly to the directors, the executive directors of the Met Office. They give us a budget, and every few months we had to keep going to them saying, look, we've done this stuff, we think it's cool, do you think it's cool? If you think it's cool, can we keep having money? And then they can say yes or no. And that's how we've lived for the last couple of years. It seems to work well. Um, the kind of, our philosophy is that if they give us a metric, you know, if you do this, you can have money, we'll hit that metric blindly without actually trying to do the things that we're trying to do, right? We'll, we'll align ourselves to that metric rather than the metric being aligned to what we're trying to achieve. I think it's because, our, because what we're trying to do is quite broad, right? Saying culture change and checking out new technologies and scientific processes is quite a broad thing to say. So it's hard to just randomly put numbers on those. Um, so it's very much done on, on like a ad hoc basis. Did, when you did your self-referential price bouncy thing, mm -hmm. um, the obvious answer to that would be the algorithm on their side would go, who's, you know, am I just, you know, that, that'd be pretty easy to detect. Yeah. Did they feel like that was something they should add to their algorithm or were they not so bothered? I'm pretty sure they detected it immediately because then they were emailing each other going, look at what these guys are doing. Um, so, you know, they must have been alerted about it initially. But I think from talking to them afterwards, 
the way we were working then is not the way that we should have been working, right? We should have been kind of talking to them more about what we were doing. They kind of wanted to ramp us up slowly, and I was just kind of begging them to let me just have lots and lots of machines so that I could really just try and smash this problem. And they obviously they gave me too much resource in a brand new data center that they probably shouldn't have done. Um, but that's, I guess that's a learning exercise for them, right? Like they were saying afterwards that if we'd run this in the Ireland data center or one of the US data centers or the Frankfurt data center that have been around for ages, it would have been a drop in the ocean. It was just because we were running in a data center that had been open for two months. Like they're, they're maybe just, maybe it's just a lesson for them that they should be more cautious of their new data centers when, when customers like us. So it's not really a recurring problem that they needed to solve. No, I don't think so. I think we were both just unfortunate with that. Go for it. My, my is quite a long question. Sure. Um, so I heard EDFs using some blockchain technologies, and for me, emerging decentralized technology is quite, quite an interest. Um, I know S3 is not a real alternative for out there for decentralized storage of data, especially as big as yours. But I'm curious if you study the subject, if you consider any technology. So. As I said, we researched new technologies, right? So we have looked at blockchain. It's been kind of like a recurring thing. We haven't. We don't feel like we've found like it. We've never gone. Oh yeah, actually, this would be perfect for this. Like necessarily within our model. Um, there's stuff that we've thought about to do with like provenance of data and proving like this data was produced by this model at this time and it looked like this. It then went through this process and this process to be transformed into this. It was then given to this other partner and they did some stuff to it and then it went to this partner and then it eventually ends up on the telly but you can then trace that back through all those processes so that you could question the, the scientific kind of reliability of that data um, so that's quite interesting and kind of I've been thinking a lot recently about you know I was saying about these dask graphs that get calculated as well like those could be stored and then hashed and then you could use that as part of the data provenance as well so you can see exactly the calculation or the query that was run to produce that and so like keeping like a ledger of the operations that have happened to the data could be really useful, but actually putting the data itself with all that because of the volumes, it's, it's trickier. So, I mean, it's, it's a big thing that we're thinking about and we don't have any answers on it really. Like we're, we're finding at the moment that a lot of people need to move into object stores for storing vast amounts of data. And so that's one of the things that we're interested in, in investigating. But um, I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. Well, yeah, yeah that, that's an aspect of it. Another aspect would be file storages, these decentralized file storages. Well, they, they try and solve the problem of pricing that you expose there. Uh, I, I know of two big ICOs, they raise a lot of money, but it's not a technical product out there to solve the problem. Yeah. And the, the trouble is with distributed storage is you lose speed, right? You know, there's often latency issues, and it depends how your workload is carved up, right? Like one of the things I'm quite interested in is can we push a load of data into AWS and push a load of data into Azure and have a load of data in our data center and then run like a cluster that will run across all of those and it maybe moves the compute into whichever's cheapest at the time, or you know, but you're still relying on replicas of the data, right? Or you can push part of the data to one place and part of the data to another and then kind of scale out that way, but it's, it's kind of, yeah, that's partly what my life is at the moment is thinking about these things. So, yeah. Do you have to get involved in the, the data being near where you want to process it? Do you have to get involved in that in the AWS space or do they, in essence, do that for you? You mean in terms of like S3 being close to the computer using an AWS? I don't know if I fully understand. Yeah, that just, I mean, do, Deciding where you're going to put the data versus where you're going to try and process it if you're using things like spot pricing. Yeah, I mean... I mean, you're constrained to a single site, presumably. Yeah, I mean, in AWS, when you push data into S3, it will be in all availability zones within that region, right? They replicate into all the data centers. And so, but you're still, you know, if we push data into London, we can use the compute and the pricing in London, but if the price drops in Ireland, we if we run the compute there, we'll get like trans-region charges on their network as it goes through, right? You still get pretty good throughput on that network, but it's not gonna be anywhere near as fast as being in the same data center. So then there's a decision for us to make, is like, well, do we have multiple copies of our data in multiple regions so that we can play those off, but then we've got to pay twice as much storage charge, so it's like, is it what, you know, are we gonna save enough to be worth all the, the storage charges, so, yeah. Do you get help from your scientists in solving some of those problems? 
in terms of doing the maths? Or does um, that something you tend to do yourself? So, I mean, we have, like, computer scientists that are, you know, supercomputer experts and, and work within that, right? And they, I guess they handle a lot of that. Like, I don't know, like most massive organizations, we have lots of people that call themselves scientists and they don't know who each other are and they do all sorts of different things all over the place, right? But we do, we do have specific people for thinking about network latency and doing the maths of can we move things? And, you know, it's weird thinking about, like, the speed of light as being like a factor in doing these calculations, but it's at the point where, where it is now, right? So I, there are people thinking about that. I'm, my angle is more from like an engineering point of view. Can I actually build a thing that does this that somebody else has told me should work, so. Any more questions? Are we all done? Cool, thank you very much to Jacob Tomlinson.